Okay, hi everyone. My name's Kyle. Uh, so I am the technical marketing manager, that's my title. It's a little bit of a misnomer, but uh, from Redis Labs. Uh, and today we're gonna talk about microcontrollers in Redis um, and how I set fire to my desk. So uh, first I wanna start out with some just audience participation because I wanna make this interactive for everybody. Um, who here um, has used Redis before? Raise your hand if you've used Redis before. A few people in the back, okay. Great. Uh, who here has used Node.js before? Raise your hand. Good, okay, that's good. I don't have to explain Node. Uh, who here has developed anything, any software for a microcontroller? Raise your hand. A few people as well, okay. Uh, and then this one is, has nothing to do about your tech stack experience or whatever. Who here is from north of the Minneapolis-St. Paul metropolitan area? One per, a few people, okay, good on the same line I'm seeing over here. Okay, uh, so I'm actually from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and if you were to walk, it's 398 hours from here. Um, I have to tell my team who's based in California, which would be down here, or in Tel Aviv, which would be over there, uh, where I live, and usually I just say, effectively, look at Las Vegas and then start walking for 18 days without stopping, and you'll be in, directly north and you'll be in Edmonton, Alberta. So um, I had a few questions and so I had to add that in. Um, so this is gonna be a little bit of a narrative. Uh, this is a project that has spanned jobs, it has spanned years, um, it spanned many versions, um, and so it's gonna be a little bit of a journey uh, as we go along. So first, let's start at the beginning. A long time ago, there's no galaxies, it was Canada. Um, the CBC, uh, who's our TV and uh, radio provider, did a story about ice wine. You guys know what ice wine is? Have you had ice wine before? Raise your hand if you've had ice wine. A couple, good, good, good. Uh, so ice wine is this. If you see it, it'll be in this one of these skinny bottles in the liquor store. It's super expensive, um, and it's grown in Canada. You don't think about Canada growing wine very often, but we're one of the best producers of ice wine in the world. This would be in Ontario, which is on the other side of Canada, but regardless. Uh, the problem with ice wine is basically what happens is it, it works on the function of freeze distillation. So what happens if you have grapes on the tree and then they freeze, and at a very specific point before they hard freeze, they have to be picked. So the reason it's in these skinny bottles is because they actually have to pick it at a very precise temperature. And so you have all these vineyards that have all these trees, and effectively what happens is, eh, like 60% is wasted, right? So it's very expensive. So this bottle is probably, uh, you know, $60 US, right? Like pretty expensive stuff. And so the way the vineyards handle this is they keep people in the vineyard sitting until the temperature reaches the right thing, and then they run out into the vineyard and start picking the grapes as fast as they can because if they wait a day, or even if in the same day, it might be spoiled by then. So the other thing they have is that one side of the vineyard may be two degrees Celsius warmer than the other side of the vineyard, and you know one side's spoiled and the other side's good, and so it's a really hard problem to solve. And so you know I'm a person who's a problem solver naturally, and I had been working with Redis, uh, and I had been working with a microcontroller for another project that I was working on, and I said, hmm, I wonder if I could combine these two disparate projects I'm working on to solve a problem that no one has actually commissioned me to solve. And then it got into my head, um, and so I started down this road of trying to put Redis, which is a high-performance in-memory database, um, and interface it onto a microcontroller in a way that it could read temperature. And so uh, one of the in-progress goals is this guy, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and I'll show you some kind of fun Mr. Wizard things that'll go on with it. Um, so that's how it all began. But before I go on, I should talk about Redis. Uh, Redis Labs is my employer, so the next few slides will be our kind of standard marketing deck, but they're useful for this presentation. Um, so a couple things, Redis is a high-performance in-memory database platform um, with um, operational analytics and hybrid use cases. Uh, Redis Labs is the uh, home of Redis. We pay the creator of Redis. 
the creator, Redis Labs did not exist to create Redis. It's kind of a weird story, but he's our employee now and one of our stockholders. And um, we have Redis Enterprise, which is an enterprise grade version of Redis. So basically what we do is we take the open source Redis and we put it into a, uh, an enterprise grade ecosystem and then you can use it to have up to uh, hundreds of terabytes of data all in memory. So that's the other thing that's distinctive about Redis is that we don't believe that data should be stored on disk. And we believe that if you're storing on disk, you're making a mistake in 2018. Um, so let's talk about the top differentiators of Redis. Um, performance, simplicity, and extensibility. Um, and these are all relevant, so I know this looks really marketing like I'm not trying to sell you anything. Take a look at this. Um, this is the one about performance. A couple things on this slide, if you look at it, um, the right-hand uh, bar graph shows if you need to get to a million writes per second, and writes is an important metric here because if you're in memory, it doesn't matter, reads and writes are the same speed. So like a SQL Server, for example, writes are significantly slower than reads. Um, that's not the case with the in-memory database. Uh, Google did a benchmark and they said, okay, how many servers would it take to get to a million writes per second? Um, Redis required two, uh, Couchbase required 50, and Cassandra required 300. Um, so that tells you the scale at which writing is really relevant. As well, it's got low, um, it has very low latency as well, usually sub millisecond, so um, that's important to know. When we start talking about sensors, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. The other thing that's distinctive about it is the simplicity. It's a little bit different than most databases. You know, you have MongoDB, which is like a, a document store. You have SQL Server, which is a relational database. We're what we call a key structure store. It's kind of similar to a key value store, but a little bit more complicated. Effectively, what you do is you have a key, um, and that key is associated with a particular structure. Structures you're probably familiar with, linked lists is our list structure. Hash maps, something you've probably seen before. Um, Bitmaps, that's kind of just like a blob. Uh, and then some of the ones that we'll talk about today, uh, sorted sets, which is it's like a mathematical set, but each member in the set has a native sort order, which I'll be using that. Uh, and then we have streams, which is our newest data structure, and this is new. It's actually still an unstable right now, so it's not even like available in our product yet. But that's one we'll talk about at the end of this. And a stream is basically a way to uh, kind of deliver a push-like um, system, uh, as well as being related to time series. So, uh, but everything relates to a, a key at its heart. So you can have compound keys, and the, one key can have much data that's associated with many sub keys, and that's not really important for this talk, but you can store a lot of data in very complex ways. Um, and the next thing that I want to talk about that's also relevant today is extensibility. Um, so a few years ago, Redis is known for being really fast and you know, we have these commands that you issue, it's not like a lot of databases, but it's kind of limiting because it had only these set structures and then Salvatore would get pull requests on GitHub and say, hey, I, you know, I'd really like this feature request for my particular use case, and he would reply, no, and then just move on and close the issue. Well, th that's great, but it's not very sustainable, and so what they did is they created a module system, and the module system can actually allow you to create your own data structures in any systems language you know, C, C++, Rust, other ones are possible, but that's the ones that people have built modules for right now. Um, so you can basically create any type of structure you want, and it makes it a multi-model database. So um, in this, you know, like I, I work a lot with our search engine module, so it's like a full text search, kind of like Elastic. Um, but there's also a graph module and time series and all sorts of other things like that. Um, and those are all built in the module system, which we'll talk about later as well. So uh, that's Redis. And then we'll talk about um, a microcontroller. Now, uh, what I want to talk about first is what a microcontroller is and what it is not. Um, so a microcontroller is basically a system on a chip. Um, it lacks a true operating system. Uh, it doesn't have a screen interface. It doesn't have a keyboard. The CPU is maximized for interfacing other things. Controller is the keyword. Um, so you know, unlike a lot of things that are general purpose, this is designed to have a lot of inputs and outputs. It's low power, usually these are designed to run um, in some way that can reduce its uh, consumption of power down to microamperes. Um, it has very low capability intentionally, um, and uh, it's really, really cheap. So the, the thing that you have to realize is that you're, every, in your everyday life, you're surrounded by microcontrollers, right? So you use your microwave, 
You ever wonder how it does all that stuff? That's a, micro, a microcontroller that you put in, how many seconds it's gonna be there. Uh, I one time tried to count up the number of microcontrollers in my house and I just said, this is impossible. You know, my, um, like my little Nest um, thermostat, microcontroller. Um, you know, in my furnace itself, microcontroller. Like all these different things have microcontrollers and they're everywhere uh, because they're so cheap and ubiquitous. But then I also wanna talk about what a microcontroller is not because I think this is where people get confused. Um, it's not a Raspberry Pi. Um, that's what a lot of people think about when they think of IoT uh, or other single board computer. In fact, those are quite different. Those are just small computers, right? A microcontroller is a distinct entity. Um, a microcontroller does not have Linux on it. Um, and in fact, that's a very purposeful distinction. Um, and, and having Linux on a machine, um, while we think of our servers and we talk, we're now we're having lots of conversations with containers, you know, pets versus you know, farm animals and all that stuff. Um, having Linux machines in, in an IoT situation is a really bad idea uh, because when was the last time you updated your microwave? Like you would not really want to do that. So a microcontroller being simpler is a better idea for that. Um, they're usually designed for general purpose computing, so they have things like a graphics sy system for you know actually displaying something on HDMI, um, and uh, they're actually quite high performance compared to a microcontroller. We'll get into the specs of the one that I'm using right now, but you know, uh, Raspberry Pi is pretty much equivalent to a computer five years ago that you would pay a thousand dollars for. Um, this is equivalent to a computer you would probably have bought in 1984, so quite different. And a microcontroller, excuse me, a uh, single board computer uh, is usually expensive. Um, microcontrollers are, are not. And to give you an idea of expense, I mean like a Raspberry Pi, what, 30 bucks? You have the, the single little like uh, Pi Zero for 10 or $15, depending how you get it. Uh, these are usually about $1 or sub $1. So there's a big difference here. Give you some examples of microcontrollers. The, the one most people would end up knowing is the Arduino. Uh, this is the Arduino Uno. Uh, another common one, this is used in a lot of serious projects, the STM32, which is based on um, an ARM-based system. The Arduino is an 8-bit AVR microcontroller, so it's, it's a very low capability machine. Uh, the STM32 is a 32-bit ARM microcontroller, um, ARM, or, or, excuse me, ARM Cortex. Um, the other one is the Parallax Propeller. This grew out of the basic stamp system that Parallax cr created in the um, late 90s. This is actually an interesting microcontroller. It's got, I think, eight parallel processors in it uh, that are very low power, so you can kind of like turn it up as you go along. So there's some uses for that, but not for everybody. Um, then we have the ESP8266, which is the one we'll primarily be talking about today. Um, and that's in the upper right hand corner. They're gonna look a lot different because it's a very ubiquitous microcontroller and there's no one design of it. So you may see that later on and you see the one that I have here, they look very different. And then the big brother to the ESP8266 is the ESP32. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's different and might be why I might be going to that later on. So the ESP8266 is actually an interesting technology story. Uh, it was originally built as a Wi-Fi module which had very little English documentation. So uh, it was built by a company called Espressif, which is a Chinese company based out of Shanghai, and they kind of released it to the market and they didn't actually have a lot of documentation on it in English. They had Chinese documentation and people in the rest of the world said, well, I can't read Chinese, so I'm not gonna read this documentation. Uh, well, that was to their detriment because surprise, it was very different. Um, so people were using it as this Wi-Fi module, they were taking a a Arduino, which is 8-bit, and I think it's like 12 megahertz system, and they were putting the ESP8266 and, and communicating with it to send Wi-Fi signals, because it's got a built-in Wi-Fi system. Uh, and then surprise, it's way more powerful than anybody actually knew. Uh, so it's based on the Tensilica architecture, the Extensa architecture. It's got a single core, it's 32-bit, it's 80 megahertz, so it's many times faster than the uh, Arduino Uno. Um, and uh, just some more things to know about it. Um, it uses the Harvard architecture as opposed to the von Neumann architecture. Uh, and the Harvard architecture is quite different because it creates a separate data path for, for like your variables in a program 
and your instructions. So there's some really distinctions there. So you, you have this wall, and that's intentional for microcontrollers, like you don't want to have you know, your microwave, because there's an overflow error or something, turn on in the middle of the night and burn down your house or something like that. So they make these very clear distinctions. And then it has four uh, megabit flash. So it, this is something you can access if you want to store something persistently on it. Um, so I discovered this module because I was doing some work for another uh, employer. And I had used it a little bit and did some kind of minor stuff with it. I was connecting to an HTTP service and doing a few things here and pushing things back. Very small project. And it was a good enough project that got a proof of concept to this employer and that was the end of my job for it. And at that time I had been working a little bit with Redis Labs. I wasn't an employee yet. I was writing some stuff for them. I was doing a few projects as a contractor. And I said, hey, you know, I think there's this little microcontroller that, you know, it might be interesting to try to see if I can put a Redis client on it, because that would be kind of fun, right? Like, this is something that has very low power, as we can see. And they said, well, <laughs> you're not going to be able to do that. But try and write it up, and it'll be fine. Maybe we'll put it, make a blog post out of it. Well, that takes me to version zero of this project. Um, and with that, um, I started investigating the Arduino e uh, ecosystem and how it kind of worked. Um, so I had that prior experience with it. Um, it's, the Arduino language is basically C++ as a dialect. I actually hate C and C++, and I never learned it. Um, I always looked at it. I was, came from the, the area that, like, I learned Pascal when I was growing up and basic and all that stuff, and somehow I, like, missed C and C++, um, and I never actively did a whole lot with it. Um, and so I avoided it in, in my undergraduate program, and so I was able to never learn it. But then, well, this project came along. Um, so the thing is, I knew that Redis, which is actually written in C, and there's actually quite a bit of resources for it. So I said, okay, well, if I can take that stuff that's for this big system and use it on a microcontroller, that's great. Well, the problem with that is that the ESP8266 has a very different like, idea of how the Wi-Fi stack works. It is nothing like a Linux system. Berkeley sockets aren't a thing. So I tried to port this over in a language that I didn't really like, and I said, this is ridiculous. I can't do this. So what do I do? I go, I need to rewrite the whole thing from scratch, right? Which is, I've actually heard that's a bad idea at this conference, which I've done it many times, but. Um, so that's what took me to writing the client library for it. Um, so as we go on, let's take a look at what the protocol that I had to implement, what it looks like, okay? So um, it's called RESP. It's a Reddit serialization protocol. It's a request response format that keeps a persistent connection open. Um, so basically it has control characters in the first uh, item on a line, effectively. So simple strings are prefixed with a plus. Uh, errors have a minus. Integers have a colon. Bulk strings, which are for really big blobs, have a dollar sign. And then you can, you can implement arrays, which have an asterisk. And then everything is basically the control plus the size of the data coming in, and then a line, uh, carriage return and line feed. And that's how it works, right? So it's not terrible. It's pretty simple. Um, so this is the way it looks. If you have OK, uh, an error message would look like this. Integers look like this. So you can see it's actually just the integers are represent represented as just the numbers themselves. Uh, bulk strings look like this. You can see, if you can see foobar, it has six characters. So we have the, the six right here. And then because we're doing this, we're, we're using a carriage return there. And then we have carriage return at the end. So you can see how that works. Um, and then arrays, this is how you start getting things. And the thing is, everything is effectively an array in Redis when you start looking at things. So you end up with a string like that, which represents both the request and the response in Redis. So you want to send a command, then you would say, okay, my command is the first part of the array, and then I have these arguments on top of it. And then, then the client library would mostly do this. Um, so. Uh, my experience previously, though, is I actually am a maintainer of the Node Redis project, which is the client library for Node.js. And uh, so I had a lot of things with it. It's a really great, elegant parser that some colleagues of mine wrote, and um, I maintain. Um, it looks like this, so you want to get a value. Foobar, and then you have the callback for it. It's pretty basic stuff, and you do stuff with it. But it's this nice system that you can really compose some really interesting um, and easy to use stuff with it. Um, one function call per Redis call, so you have this alignment to it. It has full type support. It will go in and you, you push in an object and 
it will do some nice things to it. Um, so it, it does these idiomatic conversions between JavaScript and, and the Redis world. And then you go into Arduino. Um, because of constraints, you can barely implement a, a serializer and deserializer. Um, command support, there's 100 and some odd commands in Redis. So I don't have the room on a small, you know, I'm talking about 32 kilobytes to implement everything in. I don't have the room to have a function for every one of them, so I have to kind of bring it out. So I have to say, okay, first I want to create a situation where I want to create a command, which is called resp init, and then you add, for example, if I'm trying to do this get, I would add two things. I would add the first thing, which is getting. The second thing is the value I want to get, so I'm getting the, at the key, foobar, and then I would send, and then I would ask for the return on it. Um, so I have to do five commands, effectively, to do the same thing I would do on the other side for just a single command. And uh, because, so Arduino has this concept of a string, quote unquote, um, so it's not really a C string, it's their own kind of object that's based in C++. So everything kind of came out as a string. I was doing no type conversions in it, nothing, right? Just, this is the idea here is to make it as minimal as possible. Um, and so, you know, you think about that and you're like, okay, what are you gonna do in this constrained environment? You're gonna run a few commands. Well, that's probably okay. So, you know, what do you do? Everything's fine. Um, so my first thing was to go through and try to send random numbers from, uh, you know, the pseudo random number generator on the Arduino into the Redis system. And I tinkered with it for a long time before I got it to work. But guess what? It worked after this time. And I got on the phone and called my contacts and said, hey, I did this thing. And they were like, what was it? I don't remember. Um, and so they said, we'll write it up and we'll be, we'll be fine. So this brings me to version one. Um, this is the first serious attempt at actually doing anything useful with, the, with Redis and the um, Arduino ecosystem on an ESP8266. So version zero is on a WeMOS mini board, which I've, has both pros and cons, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so ESP8266 is a chip, and then there's different boards that you can buy on it. And the way you get these boards, you mostly buy them from China directly. Um, they will ship them to your house for a dollar. I have no idea how they do that. Um, that somehow, I can't get anything shipped across Canada for like a letter is more than a dollar. So, but somehow, um, a chip can be produced, engineers can be paid, and it can arrive at my home in about three days for a dollar. Um, so, I played with a different, some different uh, temperature measuring things because I wanted. I'm still thinking about these trees that are going unharvested, and the wine is too expensive. Um, I landed on a DS18B20 digital temperature probe. Um, that was actually a, a long process for me. Um, it's a pretty good chip, and it's actually used for a lot of in industrial uses. Um, it uses the one wire, wire protocol, which is a terrible name because you need three wires for it. Um, so there's other ones, like if you look online, say I want Arduino-based temperature sensors, there's the DH11 and DH22. Uh, these take up to two seconds to measure a single value, which was just ridiculous to me, and they have a small temperature range. And I was thinking Canada. Right, so the other thing that I have to think about is, will my things operate at negative 40 Celsius? And here's something for you guys to know, negative 40 Celsius and negative 40 Fahrenheit are the same. So it's pretty cold, right? Um, so I, I looked at it also a thermistor and that was something you had to calibrate and I knew that wouldn't work either. So I landed on the, the DS18B20. Um, and it, it was pretty good, because it's nice because you don't have to actually have a lot of support circuitry for it, which I'm not an electrical engineer, so the less circuitry I can have, the better. Um, so my first version had a few passives, which are like capacitors and, and um, resistors and things like that. And then it had a lot of wires. And um, then I went into the battery test, so I'll talk about it just in a moment. So this is an example of uh, the first example, first test I was doing. It's on a breadboard. As you can see, I'm using these jumper wires. And that little metal object in the upper part of the picture, that's actually the temperature probe that I was using at that time. Um, and the temperature probe was like $10, this one was. And I found out I was ordering one that was like lab grade and I didn't really need that. So, the things you learn, right? Um, but that's probably not as interesting to you guys as the software. Um, so here's how it worked. Basically, I needed to ha have time, so I had to connect to an NTP server over UDP, uh, which is another protocol that I wasn't a whole lot, of, I wasn't really familiar with, so I had to do that. Um, I had to authenticate on the Redis server, I had to uh, use what's called the uh, lexi lexicographic sorted set trick. Uh, so sorted sets have these, this property where you would have a sort order, but it's a set, so a set has only unique members. So if you add something to a set more than once, you're only gonna get that 
in there one time. Um, so the problem with using it, that's, people use it very frequently for time series data, and it's a big mistake that we see a lot at Redis, because if you have your score as your timestamp, and then you have your value on the other side of that, right, so that's how it would look, it looks fine in testing, and then you start realizing, wait a minute, if I record 70 degrees Fahrenheit, it's only gonna record the first time it was 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and then it'll update every subsequent time. So it's a really bad idea. Uh, but that, at the time, when I was doing this, this is the only structure that we really had that worked for that. So I knew that if you return something and everything has the same score, it will return it back in a lexicographic sorting order. So sorting basically by saying, you know, A to Z and zero to nine. Um, so basically I had to do this kind of hack where I took the uh, timestamp as the member and then put a colon between it and then had the temperature and I would bring it back out and boy, it was inefficient. Um, but it worked. And then I would delay until the next round I needed to read the temperature, so on and so forth. I built a control panel using Node.js Express and Node Redis. And this was a few years ago, so this was an Angular 1.x 1, 1 something. Um, and yeah. So this is kind of what it looked like. Um, and I had to pull to get this data. So uh, the, it would basically go, okay, I've got this little Node.js application. I'm getting data directly in from the microcontroller, right? So it's going in right into Redis. And then my web service was reading from Redis and then generating this graph and it would just kind of every second poll, which is, it worked, but it's terrible. Um, so that's what I got. And that was my, um, the temperature of my dining room, actually. So um, you can see at the end is where I actually was like messing with it and touching it in the morning. Um, so that worked. And I wrote a blog post about it. Um, and Redis Labs was like, this is amazing. Why didn't you tell, about, tell me about this earlier? And, and, <laughs> you know, um, so they, they did find it, and it was really cool, and they, they thought, oh, this is really neat, this guy has something. Um, so then Redis Conf came along, which is the convention that Redis has every, every year, and uh, they said, well, why don't you do another version for this? And I said, okay. So this is brings me to version two. Um, so version two is addressing some limits that version one had. Um, the, the first thing was the usability. Everything was hard-coded in my first version, right? So I had the authentication string, the SSID, the password. If you wanted to update those, you had to hook it into a computer, change C source code, and move forward. Not exactly something that you could really do on any scale beyond just kind of a proof of concept. Um, the other thing was security. Everything was in clear text. Have you guys heard of, the, you know, we, we all know about cloud computing. Have you heard about fog computing? This is a new term. Cisco cooked it up a few, a few months ago, really. And the idea is that you have a fog is like a cloud, but closer to the ground. And so for IoT situations, they basically say you have a fog server, and then that connects to the cloud server, and the fog server is closer to the sensors. Um, so this is in this kind of idea. You would have a kind of closed walled garden of fog, um, and then you would send everything in clear text in that kind of closed environment, so it didn't matter if you were sending out, um, you know, low security stuff. Um, so in this, I had a, this dual mode setup, and I'll show you what it looks like in just a second. Basically, you had this big red button. You push the big red button, and it would change the mode of the microcontroller. It would actually turn it into an HTTP server that you would then post your SSID to you connect to it and work with like an access point, like a router. You connect to it and you'd say, okay, I want it actually on the next restart to connect to another server. Um, it had an inbuilt serial number, and then I used that to actually connect to an external service and get half of the authentication from here and half of the authentication from there, and then you could go in and get the Redis authentication string. And um, I had to do that to get the, to connect to the remote server, I had to do some rudimentary TLS on it. Um, so SSL was something that I, didn't think it would be a challenge. We don't think about it as being a challenge working on big systems, but SSL actually requires quite a bit of mathematics, and um, a dollar microcontroller is not up to the task at all. Um, so that's what I built, and, and I'll show you how it ended up looking. This was the rat nest of wires that I created in the second time. Um, so this is the big red button on the right, on the right side of the screen here, or I guess the left side of the screen. Um, so you you'd push that in, reset the microcontroller, uh, and then it would put it into a different mode, it'd flash different colors, so on and so forth. Uh, you'd write to the internal flash memory, so it would persist from time to time, from time restarts. Um, and then 
you would reset it again and be back in sensor mode and then you'd be good to go. And so that's how that works. I use actually AWS Lambda for that um, and API Gateway. Um, and then it, um, everything else was pretty much is the same it was, it was previously. You had NTP to get the timestamp that you would use and the, the command was for a sorted set of ZAD. Um, and it was admittedly really complicated. However, <laughs> after I presented this, I got a job with Redis Labs. Um, so it was pretty successful. I, I achieved a goal that didn't really, uh, I didn't set out to do, but I'm really happy that I built this. Um, and then what happened is they actually took this and one of my colleagues now in France, he like does this demonstration all over the world. So it's kind of cool to actually see that someone else take this and, and I was on a trip to Tel Aviv and I was sitting in this room and this person was presenting this thing that I started on a lark because I heard a radio show uh, on Canadian radio. So it's kind of like the power of open source, right? Like you do one thing and it causes waves throughout. Um, so the other thing is I want to talk about um, where it is now. And this is the, the V3 of this. Uh, in V3, I went to simplify things and make many improvements. Um, and I'll show you some more interesting things how I, I change things around. And that's what you have in front of you. So I, I kind of walled things off up here. But this is V3, or the prototype for V3. Um, and it's currently running. Everything I have right now is running. Because, you know, like, there's no screen on this, right? So I couldn't log into the conference Wi-Fi. That's a little hard when you have no screen or keyboard. Um, so I'm, like, tethered to my phone right now. But for the demo that I'll show in a second. Um, okay. So the one thing I want to talk about is I have that expensive temperature probe. I got, actually, I found a modul modular uh, temperature probe that's much cheaper. Um, I started looking at, this is the ESP8266. Um, they now came out with the next version, the ESP32, which addresses many of the problems. Because it's a single core processor, um, you have effectively like these big pauses where it has to maintain the, the Wi-Fi stack. Um, so there's, with a dual core processor in the e ESP32, there's none of those pauses. Um, I'm working right now on the deep sleep bridge. So effectively right now, this, this is attached to a lithium ion battery, uh, which at this time, <laughs> I'll tell you that the biggest challenge I've had is actually finding a battery that'll work in Canadian winters. Um, so there's a tweet that I was looking at just a few weeks ago where I was, uh, I, I kept on putting the microcontroller in the freezer because it was no longer cold enough outside to test. Um, so I have really good Wi-Fi reception in my freezer, um, which is, hey, good to know. Um, the, uh, so the battery is a big, big problem, and, and so I have, I've explored things. I've used this type of battery, which is a, um, it's like a USB charger that has uh, alkaline batteries in it. And alkaline batteries, actually, if you, I started going down this rabbit hole of exploring, like, okay, which batteries perform under which temperature conditions and, and all this stuff. And alkaline batteries should be good. However, the ESP requires 3.3 volts, and you can't really get 3.3 volts evenly out of batteries, so then you have to have a temperature or a, a voltage converter, and the voltage converters have a, you know, a constant current draw, and there's this, it's a, it's way beyond what I ever thought I'd think about batteries. Uh, lithium ions will, will stop at about, uh, they'll stop at about um, negative 10 Celsius, so they don't work very well either, and they don't actually work very well under this load, so I, you know, everybody loves lithium ion batteries, but it's a poor match for this type of um, situation. Um, so you have a deep sleep bridge that I'm working on right now where basically it will turn the microprocessor off uh, for a certain amount of time and it'll draw uh, pico amperes. Um, so it'll get that, you know, almost no current while it's off and then I can awake it and then has to go through. It doesn't save any state or anything like that, so you have to go back through and authenticate and do all that stuff. Um, so that requires a little extra engineering to bridge some, some very small contacts on top of the, the processor. Uh, but the software is where things have really changed. So the software, one thing I've done is I moved away from sorted sets. Um, because of this lexicographic sorting, it doesn't really work that well. It takes up a lot of, for what you're storing, you know, I was looking at the number of every, um, the number of bytes required is ridiculous, and we really think a lot about bytes at Redis because memory is expensive. Um, so I was looking at storing temperature. You know, temperature is pretty small value. You know, 20 degrees. Um, 21 degrees, that sort of thing. Uh, and I was end up doing like 128 bits per item minimum, and it just wasn't, it wasn't very efficient for storing such a small amount of things. So 
what I've moved to is streams. Uh, it's one of our new data structures. And that actually has an integrated timestamp in it, so I can actually avoid having to have a real-time clock or connecting to NT NTP to get the, the time, the coordinated time. Um, so streams are really, really cool because they'll also wait for things. So as you'll see in the example, because now I'm streaming from this, this is sending out data, and then I have a server over here that's a streamed server. Um, it's, it's automatic, so I'm not doing that polling thing anymore. And I'm working on avoiding the complicated uh, authentication flow by using Redis Enterprise, which actually has a built-in um, TLS authentication system. So it, it can decode TLS, and you also are authenticated with that signed key, effectively. Um, so when you look at this, it's really, I'm, I'm trying to like simplify it, make it actually good, so somebody could take this and actually deploy it in an IoT product if they were so interested in, do, in doing so. Um, and then the other thing I did was dynamic sampling, so now I can go in and, and change the sampling at, at a whim. So I can say, oh, I want it every 500 milliseconds, oh, I want it every uh, two minutes or something along those lines. Um, so let's take a look at the demo real quick. So I'm gonna switch this over real quick. You might have noticed I've got like two beverages up here. I'm not drinking these. They're actually part of the demo. Um, The screen's like kind of in the middle here, so. Bear with me while I try to get the live demo working. Um, it's like Chrome is locked up, that's fun. Yeah, okay. Get a new window and try it again. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is a live demo of everything working. Um, so as we can see here, every time this little red light blinks, we're getting a sample of the temperature. It's being sent over Wi-Fi by the ESP module, which is underneath this carrier board. And then you can see it up there. We have a pretty consistent temperature right now. Um, it, this is just where we started showing the, the sample. of actually recording much more data here. Um, if you see, I might get a little bit of a bump here. You can see it rising because of my body temperature. I'm touching the sensor. Um, then let's take the ice water. Let's hope there's not condensation on it. It should keep on going down. Fairly sensitive, but this is more of just a conduction uh, time that it takes to respond to it. Um, and I've tested this down to negative 20. It works pretty good. The only thing that it doesn't do very well is huge temperature swings. Uh, I think that has to do more with condensation than anything. Um, let's take this hot coffee and see what happens here. I should make it start spiking and it gets more samples. Pulled down significantly. You can see it's rising above the ambient temperature, but it's not as warm as it was before the, the session. Um, so this is working pretty well, and the way the demo is pretty interesting, actually. Um, so this is, like I said, live sampling. So uh, the way the demo works is I've got a Redis stream uh, that comes in and it waits for a response from the micro con uh, microcontroller that's being sent over, and then um, it's actually proxying that Redis stream into a WebSocket, which is then being sent to the browser. Um, the browser is taking that WebSocket and then converting it using into the graph using D3. Um, so I don't know if you call this full stack or what do you call, but I wired up the circuit and did the back end and did the database and also did the, the front end. Um, most people just call it crazy. Um, but when I look at this, it, there's some really interesting things that you can do with this. This is only doing one sensor. But because streams can be multiplexed, you can have hundreds and thousands of sensors in it, and they can all respond within a few microseconds to being able, like from the time that it exits the microcontroller to the time it gets to the front end, it should, it's almost zero latency between those. Um, so you could be, in our original example, you could have thousands of trees in your vineyard, and when one tree hits the appropriate temperature, 
you can send those people out to harvest those grapes. And then the other side can wait until that's there. Um, so, switch back over to the presentation momentarily. And I kind of spoiled it because you probably saw the next slide, which is, oh yeah, the fire. Um, so it's, it's really weird being someone who works in software because you, you, you don't ever do anything dangerous, right? Um, software engineering is like one of the easiest professions as far as like uh, getting insurance for because you're never doing anything dangerous, right? You don't even get paper cuts anymore. Um, so what happened with this is I, I was sitting at my desk and I had this big long desk, had two stations effectively. One station was my electronic station when I was doing all this, and then one station was my software development station. And I had a rolly chair that I was rolling between the two of them. It was about uh, three meters long, the desk. Three yards long for you guys, nine feet. Um, <clears throat> so I had been soldering on version one of this. I had created a, uh, a board that had everything on it. And of course, a soldering iron gets to 300 degrees uh, centigrade, so it's pretty hot. I didn't want to burn down my house, right? So I unplug it. And I have my soldering station where I have some steel wool here, where I was cleaning off the tip of the steel wool. Okay, this is fine. Um, and I said, okay, now I need to work on getting the uh, temperature to come back and develop the, the first version of the dashboard. So I'm like focusing. You're in software development, you're so focused, right? So you're sitting there and you're thinking about things and you're not thinking about anything else. And I had unplugged the soldering iron. I thought, oh, it's fine. And the soldering iron's unplugged. The plug's sitting several centimeters away from the, uh, the actual iron, everything's good. So I'm sitting there for about 30 minutes, and I'm like, what's that smell, right? And I, I kind of instinctively look out to the other side where the kitchen is, and I was like, I don't see anything. And then I kind of like go back to my work, and I was like, that smell, it smells like burning. And I look over to the other side to my soldering station, and I see a conflagration. Uh, there was quite a large fire going on. And I said, how is this possible? Like, I unplugged my soldering iron. It's still on its stand. The soldering iron's not on fire. What I understood was uh, most people don't use steel wool for cleaning their, their tips of their soldering irons off because there's a really important property of steel wool. It's a very th fine filament of steel. Um, and steel has the ability to become magnetized. It's a ferrous metal. Most people use a copper cleaning pad, kind of like you'd use to scrub off the... Um, you know, like a kind of a chore boy or something, you used to scrub off a, a potter pan. Uh, and what I found out is, because of the ferrous metal, it can become magnetized. So when that happens, uh, when you heat it up, it actually becomes very, uh, very easy for it to become magnetized. What had happened was, so these little fine filaments are all over my desk. Well, they heated up and they actually became magnetized. And they created this little fuse all the way to my soldering iron power supply. The power supply was a barrel connector like you would use to charge in something with, you know. It had actually gone through and bridged that connection and then caught the steel wool. It had made the electrical connection and then went back through and caught the steel wool on fire. So here I am. Do I finish my line of code or do I put out the fire? So I actually was like, okay, I, this can wait. My flow can be uh, interrupted. So I go in and I picked up, pick up the fire um, luckily it was on, I had, was smart enough to actually have a, a piece of concrete board on my desk so it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't burn my wood desk. So I picked that up and I come in to the bathroom, which is a few doors down, and, you know, I'm carrying this, like, pretty good thing. If you ever see anybody try to start a fire with steel wool, it can be really easy. You take a 9-volt battery and stick it on steel wool and it'll ignite. Um, and then I, I dump it in the sink and start running water on it. My wife comes home. Honey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just putting out a fire from work. Um, so I had to do the whole thing and explain why that was a problem um, and what happened. And so now I have a proper soldering station with a proper uh, non-ferrous metal to clean off the desk, or clean off the, the tip. And my desk has not caught fire uh, since then. Uh, but this is the only time I can think of that I was actually focusing on software and caused a fire. So. Uh, that's all that I have uh, for you. I will open up the uh, floor for questions about this, um, and uh, we'll just go from there. Just measuring the ambient temperature, yeah. 
that's all you'd have to really do. This is really good for measuring ambient temperature. Um, so it's, it's great for that. Um, they make waterproof varieties as well that you could do all sorts of different things where they're very expensive and I didn't realize that I could get this solo. Um, but it, like you said, if we flip back over, um, and if we look, this is gonna have some, um, it's gonna have some variance in it because you're actually limited by the pixels, but it's down to, um, you know, three decimal places of accuracy. So it's pretty accurate, especially with ambient temperature. You can see uh, pretty good, good shifts. But we have a very stable temperature in here. Uh, it looks like 22 degrees Celsius. So, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So this is at uh, 500 milliseconds. Um, I found that the limiting factor is actually the ESP. Um, so it, it gets kind of twitchy and it doesn't report every single time when you get down to 300 milliseconds. Um, so the response time on the DS18B20 is something like 50 milliseconds, but I've never been able to sample at that rate, even when I'm just like sampling in the, the microprocessor. Um, I think there is some delay in, like I said, it's a single core processor, so there's actually the Wi-Fi stack pauses the execution of the main program, then does stuff in Wi-Fi, and then comes back. I think there's actually some context switching cost that happens there. Uh, and I said that it doesn't have an OS on it. It actually uses RTOS, which is real-time operating system, uh, which is more equivalent to like a BIOS than, than in an operating system that we, there's no like command line or anything like that. So, yeah. Other questions? Okay. Um, well, I'm sticking around up here. I will let you know. I'll switch this over. Um, all the source code is available. If you want to start messing around with this, um, it's available here. Uh, NDC dash Redis dash ESP 8266 at Bitly. Um, so there's the dashboard source code, there's the C source code for the Arduino, um, and then if you type in Redis and ESP8266, you'll find one of my articles that I wrote a few years ago um, that actually shows the, how to wire it all up, basically. Um, the circuit is very simple, and I'll disconnect it and, and show you. I mean, it is, um, you know, there's there like six connections here. Uh, the one thing I haven't had is the bill of materials for this particular part. Uh, this was the, the thing that really made this version possible, because this has the onboard um, passives on it, so it makes it really easy. The ESP32 is interesting because they actually come in the same form factor um, with some additional pins on the other side, so I can actually plug this into an ESP32 and it's completely modular. Um, so I'll try to put on the GitHub repo that that connects to, I'll try to put the um, build materials on it as well. I just didn't get a chance to do that. Okay, so I'll give you back some of your time. I'll stick around up here if you have questions. Uh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> 